to Dig Deeper, episode two of season two, and it's great to welcome a good friend of mine, Dr. Stephen Backhouse, to the call, as well as some guests as well joining us. Uh, and I'm hoping that this will be filled with questions. Um, it's lovely to uh, see people joining in on the webinar, which, of course, if you're listening to this later on the podcast, you can always do. Just look out for the link on the WhatsApp broadcast. But a very, very warm welcome to you for Dig Deeper as we look at season two on uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Stephen, how are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm enjoying the uh, spring, the summer weather now. Are we summer yet? Are we? Still I think summer? so. I'm enjoying, very much enjoying this kind of this time yeah the shed must come into its own when in the weather that, like this oh i deliberately haven't mowed any of the uh, grass outside it's just this lovely wild garden outside yeah you what do they call it the um wild rewilding <laughs> rewilding that's right it's very on vogue <laughs> sure that's what i'm doing rewilding okay You're rewilding outside and then the other thing on on vogue is that what do they call it huga or whatever the danish call it h y oh, yeah yeah i'm huggy inside and rewilding Hugie inside <laughs> and um Stephen, I have to say, we, um, I have, I have, you and I have a new fan. Who's that? My wife. Oh, Suze. Yeah. Wow. So um, she's been saying how great, uh, how, how much she's been enjoying this. I don't think I've been complimented so much in my entire married life until I am talking to you, Stephen. So you're having a, a positive marital effect on my life. I branch out. I'm with some sort of marriage counsellor. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. Anybody who wants to just talk to Stephen and get compliments from their spouse. Kickstart your romantic life with Dr. B. <laughs> Dr. B. Well, well, exactly. I can imagine the call-in show now. Theology <laughs> and New marology. Well, here we are. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And as a reminder to those of you who are on the call in Zoom, um, then you feel free to raise questions. There's a Q&A button at the bottom um, and uh, we'll try and uh, address those questions as we um, go along. Uh, Stephen, do you have uh, one of the versions of the Bible? Yeah, I've, I've, got, I've got the uh, David Bentley Hart one that we like. Yeah. So are we doing Matthew 5 to, from where to where? Well, we are going to begin this time at the beginning, unlike last week where we began at the end. And then we jumped to Matthew 4 as well. So. Well, we looked at Matthew 4, we looked at, you know, all kinds, yeah, Matthew 4, Matthew 7, anything actually apart from the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> That's the way I like to roll anyway, so, okay. So well, Matthew I tell you what, I felt, I felt really, um, I was preparing my talk for this Sunday, actually, um, wow. and I felt really, um, uh, what's the word? Um, approved of by the theologians um, out there when Scott McKnight in his commentary oh, yeah. on, on the Sermon on the Mount. It's really, I love Scott McKnight's stuff. And uh, he, he also begins his whole commentary with the end. He does, this one probably you're thinking of. Yes. Yeah. Snap. Yeah. Very good. And um, I, I tell you what, this is such a good commentary. Yeah. So yeah. helpful. Um, but I loved it because I kind of was flipping to the bit that I'm preaching on this week and I flipped past. I thought, I wonder how he begins. And he begins with the end. I felt he does. very, he does. very he approved of building, a, building the foundation on this, building your house on this foundation. Yeah, exactly right. Why? Why do we listen to these teachings in the first place? Um, and uh, and that's what we've got here. So, yeah, Matthew, we're going to we're going to cover the Beatitudes. So we're going to look at um, Matthew chapter five. I'm going to go all the way through to uh, verse 16. Okay. So it, in our unless, unless uh, Stephen, you're going to throw another curveball and say it shouldn't end there, really. That's just the redactors. You're going to do that right. to me today? No, we'll, we'll start it. We'll read to 16, just for you, just today. Just because I like we'll, we'll, we'll keep to the uh, editor's um, all right. preference. Uh, uh, chapter 5. Uh, verse one now seeing the crowds he ascended the mountain and when he seated himself his disciples approached him and opening his mouth he taught them saying how blissful the destitute abject in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heavens how blissful those who mourn for they shall be aided how blissful the gentle for they shall inherit the earth how blissful those who hunger and thirst for what is right for they shall feast how blissful the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. How blissful the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
How blissful the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. How blissful those who have been persecuted for the sake of what is right, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How blissful you when they reproach you and persecute you and falsely accuse you of every evil for my sake. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in the heavens is great. But thus they persecuted the prophets before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should become insipid, by what shall it be made salty? It is no longer of any use, except to scatter outside for people to tread upon. You are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do they light a lamp and place it under the dry goods basket, but rather they place it upon a lampstand, and it illuminates all who are in the house. So let your light shine before humanity, so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Brilliant. There we go. Yeah. So the more observant of you will know that that's quite a significant chunk. A whole months have been going, g- given over to in, in churches, his in sermon series just to the Beatitudes. Um, but we decided to cover them uh, uh, in one week, yeah. <laughs> as well as the salt and light passage. So, Stephen, where, where should we start? Well, you probably uh, let's. I know we don't need to rehash it too much, but let's just remind ourselves that the crowds that he sees when he ascends the mountain, that's the, we already talked about that last week, which is all the, it's people that we've just been told are from many different walks of life, social classes and nationalities. And uh, they're all the people, if you go read Matthew 4, you'll see all the people that called, are called the crowds. And then they yeah. are the ones here. And the, also there's the idea that the kind of, not all the dregs, but they're they, uh, some of the great and the good are joining the dregs of society in front of Jesus. So it's it's not a, um, a, an elite crowd. So any elite person in this crowd is there kind of joining with a whole lot of other people. And we are told what kind of people they are when Jesus talks about the poor. Um, so, so that's the kind of crowd in front of him. It's not, it's the flotsam and jetsam kind of people. <laughs> it's not... He's not starting a revolution with the brightest and the best, put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, and then, I'm always, um, I can't help in the back of my head whenever I hear this passage read is to have the life of Brian in the back of my head. Yeah, right, cheesemakers. Yeah, yeah, blessed are the who? Blessed are the cheesemakers. Oh, the meek, I'm glad they're getting something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they've had a hell of a time. They've had a hell of a time. <laughs> um, <laughs> Speak oh. up! <laughs> So, uh, so, he, so those are the crowds, and then he ascends, he goes up to a mountain, right? And this is a classic thing in the Gospel of Matthew, that Jesus is presented as a type of Moses. Yeah. This is the classic thing. You'll notice if you read Luke, Jesus doesn't go up on a mountain. He, if anything, in fact, he kind of goes to a level place. So you already see, like, the editor... I mean, it's possible to go up a mountain and then a plateau, right? So it is possible to go uphill and then go to a level place. That is true. But you also, there's something going on here. Matthew is very deliberately in more than just this place. He portrays Jesus as a type of Moses. And this is another example. He's like, any moment he can to kind of identify Jesus with Moses, he takes that chance. Yeah. Yeah. Because of his audience, of course, because it was, he was primarily writing to a Jewish audience. Yeah. And what's happened is this is going to become clear as we keep going, but um that jesus is giving a new rule for the new people of god Mm -hmm. and the people of god already had a rule and they had set prayers so jesus is going to replace like the set prayers that traditional jewish people would have jesus gives them a new set prayer um what it means to be merciful or generous jesus gives them a new way of doing it right yeah so he's kind of replacing it's not an actual replacement because he's as we're going to see he says i'm not i'm not destroying the law i'm fulfilling it yeah it's like he's giving his new people a new rule of life to replace yeah the ones that they would have had before yeah 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 that as a as a sneak preview to next week and sunday uh, that's the bit i was preparing actually the the uh, abolish the law and um i didn't come to a, a, abolish it but fulfill it and and um scott mcknight was brilliant on how ha- on how you really engage with that as a as a thing but that's a sneak preview for next time yeah i mean yeah, you're probably gonna. I I I've been influenced by Scott McKnight as well, so I'm I'm sure we'll start to. We hadn't. Now you see, we hadn't had that conversation before. To you know, that's, um, 
that's not something that we planned in advance to have the books ready to hand like that. But yeah, it's a good, it's a, that's a really good book, that one. Yeah. The other one I've um, found really helpful is Divine, Com Con Divine Conspiracy. Dallas Willard. That's Dallas it. Willard, hmm. which is, you know, a, a foremost classic. But here we are. Good. And we're, we're, we got the crowd and uh, he goes up onto a mountain. So, you know, you got the illusions with, with Moses. There's a new era emerging. And again, there seems to be this um, kind of correlation as well between not just Jewish figures, but Jewish history um, kind yeah. of echoes of, you know, it's this kind of the new Exodus and the new this and the new that things that people would be familiar with um, throughout that. So yeah. what about, um, what about these beatitudes then? What are we to make of them? They're, they're not very famous. You, what do you think of this word? Uh, so my translation said blissful. Yeah, right? how blissful, yeah. What does yours say? Uh, mine also says blissful. I don't have, um, actually, Sean, I have to say. Shout out to Sean. She's still got my NT Wright copy. So uh, <laughs> uh, I'll have that back at some point, Sean, if that's all right. Um, but uh, my NIV that I've got in front of me, as well as the uh, David Bentley Hart that you've got, is... Um, uh, it just says blessed, blessed are the poor. Yeah, blessed. It's funny. I don't. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, Bentley Hart chooses that word. I don't know why. the The word is ma mac. I mean, makarios or mac makaros. I can't. I'm not. I don't pronounce Greek. But and it's and it gets translated as blessed. Uh, sometimes happy, which mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people don't actually like. The a lot of translators don't like the word happy because it it it's it gives you connotations of an emotional state when Jesus, the word makarios isn't about the emotional state. It's about, I actually quite like the word blessed because yeah. it's like he's, um, he's pronouncing that the life in front of him is a good life. Yeah. So he's, it, it's like a, the kind of word that maybe a, well, that God would use. Yeah. God is the one who blesses people. And you now Jesus yeah. is the one who's saying like, you're meek, you're humble, you're the dregs of society, you're being persecuted, you're poor. I'm going to pronounce you blessed, mm. right? So it's like a judgment he's making over a group of people rather yeah. than, he's not saying, if you, if you become poor, then you will be blessed. Like, mm. it's not a job. He's not saying, if you do this, then you will be blessed. Yeah. He's looking at the people in front of him and he's saying, you are blessed right now. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And the other word that I feel like I've heard in the past is the word honoured. Oh, okay. um, uh, honoured are those. And there's this kind of uplifting almost that God does um, because they're the very people when you look down the list that you would not expect yeah. to be uplifted. And yeah. um, this is kind of an honouring, particularly in a, it, we talked before in um, uh, the series that we did before on Mark's Gospel, this honour and shame culture. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, right. It would be like elevating people that wouldn't normally be thought of as yeah as elevated, and they wouldn't think of themselves as being elevated either. So. Well, particularly because we even use it colloquially in our language, don't we? About oh, it's you know, I try and resist it because I always feel like it's a bit of an odd thing anyway. But you know, I had such a good day today; it was so blessed. Or yeah, right. You know, I felt I blessed when that. somebody you know I found a car park space. God bless yeah. me. Yeah. And, yeah right. You know, I don't want to go down that because that can end up in a kind of rabbit war. In a, you know, I don't want to go down that conversation. But, but, um, but that sense of which those those that that Jesus is describing here by their descriptions, they would not be the people that anyone thought anyone had blessed. They, no. they, were, they were the dishonourable. They were they were the people that, well, <laughs> you know, if you're being persecuted, you must have done something for it. You know that kind of thing. You know, it's that. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, obviously, because this is the kind of guy I am, <laughs> I'll just remind people I'm a political theologian. Yeah. And that there's a lot here about, you know, you got to think about this is the, this is like the, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not the constitution, but the manifesto for a new movement here. Yeah. So it's like Jesus is saying, I'm going to start my movement with you guys. Um, and so there's a sense that he's, it's not just kind of individually like oh, I'm going to bless your life individually. It's like, no, this is what I'm, I've chosen you to be my people. Yeah. Right. Cause you remember this is about the formation of a new people, a new rule for a new people. Yeah. And he's like, I've chosen you. Yeah. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to bless you. Like I pronounce you blessed. It's not, I'm going to make your life happy because that's clearly not going to happen. It's I pronounce the life you're leading right now as the one that I have favored. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Seems to me that um, a lot of these 
um, Beatitudes. Uh, uh, just as a side note, where do we get the word Beatitude from? You know, I don't really know. Yeah, it's the- I feel like, I, I feel like this is just showing my um, uh, lack of good memory, but Colin, I think, spoke about it on, on Sunday, okay. what Beatitude was. Um, but um, anyway, we'll park that because neither oh. one of us have knowledge right now on that. Yeah, so this is the Beatitudes. I don't know quite know why it's called. A be oh, yeah. Beatitude, so, that's right. Because So, so the, the, when you're beatified, yeah. when you are uh, like turned into a saint or you're blessed, you're, it's, a, okay. it's, 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 the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the activity of being blessed or being okay. brought into the, yeah. elevated to sainthood, right? Yeah. So the Beatitudes here is when Jesus is conferring some kind of status upon the meek, the humble, the poor. Yeah. Etc. So, so, so one of the things that, you know, a lot of these are actually quite, in some ways, easy to understand, harder to live out, of course, you know, as often the way Jesus, easier to say than to do. Yeah. Um, exactly. But the first, the first is an interesting phrase, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit. Yeah. Um, it feels to me like that's quite ambiguous, you know, is it, is it a sense of someone who's downhearted? Um, was it more than that? How, how would you approach that verse? Yeah, it's, it has to do more with your resources. So, so the phrase, so Luke, famously, the gospel of Luke doesn't have in spirit. It just yeah, has. Okay, interesting. Uh, but they use the same word and it's trochos. Again, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but it's um, um, P-T-O-C-H-O-S. So tro trochos. <laughs> but I've heard some people, and I don't know if this is true, even if it's not true, it should be. So I take this with a grain of salt. But I've heard some people describe it as like it. Then it's the word for a poor person, but it, it itself comes from the sound you make when you are gathering spit to spit on the ground. So like tokos, and the idea is that it's the is the kind of colloquial term for a poor person, which sounds like you're spitting hmm. because they're so uh, despised. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is the this is the word. Now Jesus isn't spitting at a poor person. He's using the word for this yeah. class of type of person. And one of the things about the tokos is that they were the, the poor of the land who didn't know where their resources. They had no resources for the next day. They uh, they were living hand to mouth. Yeah. So that was the tokos. They were the kinds of people that I mean they weren't re they weren't storing up in barns. Jesus will tell some parables about people who store up in barns. They didn't have any provision for the next day they they had to live again the daily bread give us today our daily bread is a mm. phrase we're going to meet soon yeah yeah that was the chocos they needed to live day by day so when jesus says blessed are the poor in spirit so when again remember like jesus might have been saying this sorts of things in different places yeah. so maybe sometimes he said poor maybe sometimes he said poor in spirit I, it, he's not it's not the opposite he's not spiritualizing Matthew isn't spiritualizing something that Luke had as just physical. Okay. It's the same description, which is blessed are the people who don't have any reason, who don't have the, the resources to get them through to the next day. Hmm. So when you're poor in spirit, you're somebody who knows I don't have what it takes. I, I can't do this on my own. That your, that your physical poverty s seems to impact your, yeah, your, sense of being which it does we know that we know that to be true yeah i can't get through the day i mean is yeah. that a, is that a spiritual practice or a physical practice like it's the same thing right it's yeah just, yeah i can't do it i don't have what it takes and jesus talks about them now there's an interesting parallel here because a lot of chalk type people it's almost like a social class or it's like a it's like we would say you know there's poor people and then there's homeless people right like we we in english have the ability to describe the difference between different levels yeah of yeah, that's true. Abject homelessness yeah. is different than, oh, I'm living, I'm living below the poverty line. Or yeah. so the talk also this kind of people who don't have like what it takes to get through the next day. And they're always relying on the mercy of, of other people. And um, interestingly, there was a kind of a group of religion, the kind of religious angle of the tokos, or another group you'd call the anawim. And the Anawim were people who lived off of the mercy of the temple. Okay. So they would always be hanging around the temple. They didn't have like jobs. They didn't have any savings. They just lived off the mercy of the temple. And they were mm -hmm. Anawim. 
and they were associated with the kind of attitude of like um, devotion to the temple and like waiting for the temple to for Israel to be redeemed. They were almost like holy beggars, mm. right? Who would live who would live in the temple. They would just be kind of waiting. They would be praying and they'd be waiting for the Israel to be redeemed. And that's all they would do. They weren't they weren't working. They were just kind of there to be like um, prayerful presence. Yeah. And two of them are Simeon and Anna. Yeah. Who we meet in Luke's gospel. Yeah. And they're they're hanging around the temple and then Joseph and Mary show up and they recognize see they're the poor in spirit waiting for their redemption. They see Jesus and they say, Ah, oh, he's the one who's gonna redeem. Yeah, wow. Um, so Matthew doesn't have that story, but Simeon and Anna are poor in spirit as well. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So there you go. That's just a little connection. <laughs> there's like there's kind of lots of ripples here of, of, yeah. of the type of people that Jesus is saying, hey, you know those people? They're my people. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, is there anything that ties these uh, categories of people together? Is it, is it, is it ra random in some ways? Or is there are these kind of groups of people that other, would otherwise be ignored? Uh, we've already kind of touched on that in the sense yeah. they are the excluded ones. Well, it's all to do, one of the common threads, that's a really good question, actually. I've never been asked that before. Uh, and But I think the answer is something like they're all people who are not, um, I've used this for, for Mark a lot, actually. These are all people who are not clutching tightly to their own rights. They're not availing them. They're not living a peri uh, uh, an attitude towards the world of like gathering as much as they can and then holding on to it, right? They're not fighting for their own rights. They're not storing things up. They're not seeking vengeance. They're not trying to avail themselves of whatever it takes to get what's coming to them. Yeah? Yeah. And so Jesus is that, and we, we can, we're gonna see this, this is the theme. But so for example, but he always uses, he actually uses kind of socio-political language for them. So he's like, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the ones who aren't, taking care of like storing things up for themselves who aren't living a life of constantly uh, amassing and hoarding and defending themselves. Blessed are the poor in spirit for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. I'm going to start my movement with you. Not with the people that you would, if you were going to start a movement, you'd normally start with the people who are really good at yeah. getting what's rightfully theirs and yeah. killing their enemies and taking it. Right. And Jesus is like, I'm going to start my movement with the people who are, not doing that yeah yeah and then yeah. and then he's going to keep going right he's going to talk about the mourning um the the gentle or the meek they're not the ones who are like fighting to to get what they think is rightfully theirs but they're going to inherit it anyway yeah um the merciful are not people who are who are trying to have justice no matter what yeah they're they're willing to waive justice for the sake of mercy and he mm -hmm. said you are going to be blessed because you're going to have that shown to you as well. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It, every dichotomy is always something to do kind of with building the, the kind of think of like what you would take to what the world would say you need to, to start a successful movement. Jesus is saying he's taking the opposite. Yeah. Dichotomy. Yeah. Cause it's, I think it's interesting when you read these because you know, most Christians want to be blessed. <laughs> Most yes, Christians want to live a blessed life, and in some ways, understandably, that you know, when you look at it like a manifesto, you kind of think, well, what do I need to be blessed? Okay, I need to be poor in spirit. Right, I'll go and do that, and it becomes this kind of tick list, like a job. Yeah, yeah, like this is. But it feels to me like he he's saying it to people who for whom this isn't something that you can achieve. No, this is something that you are. Yeah, and. But is there anything that for those of us that may not call ourselves poor in spirit, because right. actually life, life has worked out OK in that regard for us. But is there something that is a challenge to us or is it just to say. Actually. In this topsy turvy kingdom, the place that you might feel that you have your seat at the table, which you're used to having as a place of privilege. Yeah, because of your wealth, because of your education, because of the color of your skin, even you know, those places of privilege, actually you are 
you need to watch as as I favor others. Actually, there's a yeah, favoritism. I think, I think here. it's that. I think it is that. I, I, there is a there is a, a there's a judgment here. Jesus is the rightful judge, and J Jesus is saying, of all the groups of, of options out there of ways to live, this is the way to live that I am affirming. So if you're not living this way, pay attention. Yeah. Right. So it's not like it, it, it's not like a kind of a you must mourn it's not like a i've described it not as a, a prescription of how to get into the kingdom of heaven it's a yeah. description of the kinds of people that are in the kingdom of heaven yeah so he's not prescribing it he's not saying if you do this then you will he's saying yeah. the people who are part of my movement look like this yeah yeah and and so it's a way to kind of not let people like us despise the the people who are not um, uh, go-getters or yeah. rich or wealthy or powerful. And, act and actually, it's much harder for us. Yeah. Because there's an extra hurdle for us because we have to, well, we need to know what it's like to be poor in spirit or we need to know, you know, yeah, actually, sure. in some ways, and, and I think this is true, actually, it's often the people with privilege that oh, find yeah. it hardest to find find God. But this is what Jesus says. It's easier for how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what he yeah. says. He yeah. tells you directly. He doesn't say the rich will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, look how hard it is. Yeah. It's so much harder because you have to unlearn and unclench yourself from so many things. You're not poor in spirit when you're rich. Yeah. You literally do know where your bread is coming from the next day. Yeah. I remember when I was, um, you know, uh, 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 you're tempted to invest all of your emotion and your energy into that rather than into yeah. living in the moment. Yeah. I remember when I was in, um, I did a, a trip to see the work that, that Tear Fund are doing out in um, Uganda. Okay. And I was out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and the Sunday worship in this village, everybody came on Sunday. And, um, and it was, you know, classic, you know, long service, but a big part of it was the, off the offering. Okay. And um, the offering, and it wasn't a prosperity offering, it was just the offering. Okay. And, um, and it was so moving to see these men and women come forward with what you could obviously tell was literally the first fruits and vegetables wow from from yeah. the land they'd literally just picked them and that was their offering first fruits first fruits in every sense of the word wow and um in, in a situation where i imagine that that could have been for as much as i knew that could have been a day's meal or a week's income i don't know i don't know what that would have translated right. to but but there's this sense in which they they were poor even by you know even if you kind of contextualize their poverty as it were yeah um and not contextualize it in a kind of necessarily global sense but in a localized sense they were still poor yeah, yeah. and yet they were not poor in spirit they were so generous they were overwhelmingly wanting to make an offering to god not because the pastor kind of has manipulated it but because they are so grateful to god um, but poor in spirit doesn't mean miserable no so those people are poor in spirit you said they weren't but i think they are poor in spirit because they were giving generously. No, I know. I think they were poor in spirit. I guess what I'm saying is ah. um, that the poor in spirit, like it was clear that that wasn't. It was not an obstacle to them to meet to meet yeah. God. Like what you were saying is that essentially, for those of us who have it all, actually, it's harder to let go of things. Yeah, yeah. So the people who can, who aren't like trying to defend themselves against the future. Yeah, they're that the people who aren't doing that they're the poor in spirit yeah and yet the ones who i have observed who fit that kind of description as it were are much much more trusting much more open to the things of god than than i am yeah probably. yeah for sure so hey, there is a sense of like well you're blessed when you don't when you're not tempted to think that you are the master of your own universe uh, and that you are your best you are the best provision for yourself um you're actually blessed it's actually better for you yeah you know which is why which is why i've often said this and and i i do say this like 
it's not true that God wants you to be rich. <laughs> That's not true. Um, there is a difference. Like, and a lot of Christians, especially sort of on the charismatic end of things, and certainly in the ones that's um, affected by like American Pentecostalism, is like, you know, um, God wants you to be rich. Like, no, actually, yeah. being rich is hoarding up. Being rich is when you have more than enough. Yeah. Keeping your goods out of circulation. Yeah, that is not it's a blessing. It's not good for anybody. It's yeah. not good for you or for anybody, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. So we've had a question coming, which is great to see yeah. that. Someone said, um, can you talk about those who hunger and thirst for justice? I've got it, hunger and thirst for righteousness here. I don't know what your uh, translation says. Uh, um, yeah. um, hunger and thirst for what is right, for they shall feast. Yeah. Um, so again, they're going to be the people who are, this is from within the context of Sermon on the Mount the social political context is that it's the people who are waiting to be justified. Like, I think a lot of this is they're the ones who are waiting for, for the God's people to be redeemed and set right. Um, they're living under Roman occupation, right? They're living in lands that are not, that are not pure or that are subjected to hostility. And so they are waiting for, for righteousness. So the word righteousness there or justice is just God's way. So they're waiting for God's way to be followed. Um, the acts of righteousness are just the acts of obedience to God. Mm -hmm. And we're going to meet them later on. Mm -hmm. So blessed are you who hunger and thirst for, for righteousness. So you, you're going to get what you want. Like it's a, a proclamation that the kingdom is here. It's related to the blessed are the poor in spirit because yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who are hungry and thirsting for God's way to be followed, which is another way of describing the kingdom of God, mm -hmm. right? Where people say yes to God. Blessed are you who are waiting for the situation in which people can say yes to God and be righteous because it's here. You're going to feast. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, it isn't, and, I, and I, listen, I, I actually do think I like justice language. Like I'm not against it, but it's not so much a, um, it's not so much a, a, a proclamation of people who are like social justice campaigners. It's not so much those kind of people. It's more the people who are currently being subjected to violence and they're waiting for their redeemer. Right? Yeah. He's saying, blessed are you who are waiting for the world to be put back to rights because it's happened. Yeah, okay. That's helpful. That's helpful. So we have this, do you know much about the form? You know, it was written here in um, kind of almost poetic form. I don't know whether that's deliberate, whether it's, whether Matthew's trying to make a point here about whether it's kind of akin to the 10 commandments in, in some ways. Oh, I'm sure there's some very elaborate and deliberate <laughs> form here. Which well, I... not, and also not all of it is in that form. No, right, yeah, it's, so, it is like a little kind of uh, poem. I don't know, I don't know the answer to all those questions. It's interesting how it switches though, isn't it? There must be a reason yeah. for that. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it, in a way, it kind of is a standalone, like, you know how the Sermon on the Mount is, is a collection of sayings of Jesus put together in one place, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and the, the, the Beatitudes are, they do kind of stand alone, and it's probably legitimate to think of them that way. It's not at all impossible to think of him as as using this as his opening every time he shows up. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the whole sermon that comes after it. You can just kind of have that by itself, right? Yeah. It's, it's probably all right that, pe that a lot of people tend to spend weeks just on this. Yeah. Uh, one thing that people have pointed out is that the blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, in a way is everything else following the next three chapters five six and seven is just an elu elucidation of that one verse so in some ways you could sum up the whole sermon on the mount as blessed are the poor in spirit for wow. your kingdom of okay heaven. yeah there's a lot here about persecution um his his uh final two um beatitudes oh, can we, before we go on because i because yeah. sean has just written a a, a comment so, so the comment was like, what about people who are privileged people who are seeking after justice? Is this what, is this verse directed at them? 
And I suggested it wasn't quite suggested at the social justice campaigners. Um, it wasn't directed at the social justice campaigners in the context of the original listeners of the Sermon on the Mount, right? But it is directed at people today of like, uh, ask yourself, are you hungering and thirsting for God's way to be manifest on earth? If you're not, <laughs> what's wrong with you? <laughs> you need to start to be like someone it, who is thirsting for that. But it's a, an, if you think about it, it's actually an attitude of empathy. So we mm. might often think of kind of, um, uh, you know, stereotypical, I'm really being really stereotypical, but the stereotypical kind of social justice campaigner on Instagram, privileged person just sort of t mashing the like button instead of actually doing anything from their place of privilege. They're just kind of, you know, I'm trying to avoid phrases I hate like virtue signaling, but you know what I mean? Like they're just, they're just social Insta Instagram, social media campaigners. And they, but to be a, to hunger and thirst for righteousness is to ask you to have empathy for people who are to put yourself in the place of people who are actually being oppressed, right? It's more than just to kind of want things to be to be right and finding um, finding causes to to campaign for. It's to actually empathize, to actually live with, because event we're going. The next one is uh, mourn with those who mourn, right? Or it's connected to that. So, like, it's an identification with the people who hunger and thirst for righteousness that we're being asked to to have uh, in exactly the same way we're being asked to identify if you don't think you're poor in spirit then identify with porn learn what it is to be poor in spirit if you're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness learn what it is to be the kind of person who really is needs god's way to be manifest on earth mm. so it's a call for uh, empathy and identification with it's again it's that kind of yeah uh, um uh, identification with the marginal not just um, pressing the like button. When somebody yeah, yeah. Gives In a moment, I want to talk about the persecution because he takes up quite a bit of, of that. Uh, um, yeah. But but actually, I'd love to know, what is our posture? He talks about empathy just now. Is, is that fundamental? It's not, it seems to me that our posture is not just empathy in, in those two verses that you just mentioned now about mourning and hung, um, thirsting yeah. after justice. Uh -huh. Feels to me that as I read this then, if I don't identify as somebody necessarily who is poor in spirit or meek or whatever else, then my role is to essentially do what Jesus seemed to do, which is to prefer or to empathize with. Yeah. I just wonder how, what it is we do with that. Because it, one, one way of doing that is to say, well, I'm going to try and do my best to um, uh, be mer uh, be merciful. I'm going to be do my best to be pure in heart, or to be a peacemaker, or you know, the act active is to go after the thing that Jesus describes in order to get the blessing, as it were. Um, yeah, right, right. That's one way of doing it. The other yeah. way to do it is to say, well, no, these. If it's a descriptor rather than a prescriptor, um, that when the person who walks into church or into any community of faith, where they are quite recognisably poor in spirit, or they are um mourning or they actually is to say today i'm going to prefer them i'm going to hold i'm going to honor them yeah. in this space that that is my job is to do the uplifting as it were and not in a patch I, I know a lot there's a lot of conversation as well about empowering because that suggests that i'm the one giving away the power um and again that has a kind of kind of paternalistic feel to it but i guess what I'm saying is when someone walks in is to say, actually, I'm going to prefer, I'm going to give more attention to them. Yeah. Um, I'm well, going to honor them. Right. I don't know what your feeling is about what our action is when we read this. Well, there's two things. First of all, I'd say, yeah, you're right. That is definitely one way. That's one of the, one of the, the ways we put this into action, right? It's like a, a kick up our own backside to say, are you look around? Like who, Who's the poorest person you know right now? Who's the person who's the most mourning right now? Who's the person who's the most gentle? Like everybody in their life, you have somebody in your life who's the poorest person you know right now. You have somebody in your life who's the most humble person you know. Like you have that. Everybody does. And so in a sense, it's kind of a reminder of like, look to them. Give them your attention. Let's see what happens when that happens. So it is a kind of a reminder to put your focus onto those people yeah jesus says there's something good about that like 
there's something good about being with those people and being those kinds of people, which yeah. you pay attention. Yeah. The other thing I would, I'm going to point out is that this, the Beatitudes, it really is, I mean, it, the rest is the Sermon on the Mount, right? Like, there's more that's going to come. And I would like to suggest to you that if you actually took the Sermon on the Mount seriously, not as some individualistic abstract idea, but as an actual rule of life, if you actually don't kill your enemies, if you actually don't do what it takes to like, you know, defeat your enemies in court, um, if you're actually living some of these ways that he says, uh, we're going to look at it in a second, well, in a few days time, if you actually live by not taking public oaths, when he says do not do not give oaths, he's not talking about private promises, he's talking much more about things like we would recognize today as like the uh, Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag, or the when you had to give an oath to the Queen as an Anglican. I did. Jesus says, don't do that. <laughs> but the kind of oaths that he's saying to do, they were public oaths to kind of prove your good standing in public. And Jesus says, don't do that. Now, if you take him seriously, you will find society mistrusts you, wants to take advantage of you, will call you a traitor, you won't be very patriotic, you won't be a winner in that world, and you will start to look like someone who is mourning, who is persecuted, okay. <laughs> who is humble. Okay. By following the Sermon on the Mount, you become the people that he's it's saying. So that. interesting. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I liked about um, Scott McKnight's um, thoughts on it is that he grounds the sermon on the mountain what he calls the jesus creed i mean there's a book that he's written called the jesus creed anyway oh, okay. um which is um uh the verse of course when jesus is asked um which of these is the greatest which of the 613 laws is the greatest commandment of them all and okay and he says you know love the lord your god with all your heart soul and mind and strength yeah and uh and love your neighbor as you uh you know and so on okay. so the uh, and there, there is no greater commandment than these Right. And and he says, essentially, Scott McKnight says. What what this is about is if you want to live that out. Yeah. Follow the Sermon right. on the Mount. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like you take this kind of ethereal love God and love your neighbor. Fine. But if you really want to love God and love your neighbor, this is really what you want do. the kingdom of God. Learn to be poor in spirit. Right. Yeah. So, so this kind of puts flesh on the bones of that kind of Jesus Creed statement, the kind of, this is what it's about. Yeah. Ah, um, oh, okay. Yeah, that's, I, I didn't realize that that's what he called the Jesus Creed. Okay. Yeah, it took me a while because he referred to it quite a while. And I was thinking, I've come across that phrase before and it was in his other book, the Jesus Creed. Um, so let's talk about persecution. Yeah, okay. Well, which is a neat segue, um, if I may, from what you just said, which is if you are to do the things that Jesus says in this Sermon on the Mount, um, you will find yourself persecuted to one degree or another. Yeah. You know? um, and so he ends the Beatitudes with blessed are those who are persecuted. Yeah. Um, because of righteousness, not just for, for being an idiot. No, <laughs> for, not, for, not, not for being a jerk, but <laughs> yeah, you don't get, you don't get points for that. Uh, but you do because of righteousness, because you, you are pursuing Probably for my sake, which is interesting. Say again. He says, in, in my name, or per, if you're persecuted for my sake or in my name. Mm. So it's it's as ambassadors to Jesus, yeah. Yeah. And then he goes on and he said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Yeah. Um, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they yeah. persecuted the prophets who were before you. And this is part of this trope that the prophet is never welcome in his hometown. You think what the prophet, do you remember, I've, I've, I'm sure I've talked about this before, like a prophet is a very political um, uh, function. So if you think about it, like, think about the prophets in the, in the Hebrew scriptures. They're always the ones who go to the kings or the priests, like the powerful people, the powerful men who are essentially saying, we've got it all locked down. We've got it all sorted. We've got our institutions. We've got our liturgies. We've got our military. We've got our money in the storehouse. We're fine. 
And the prophet always comes to one of those types of people and says, you think you've got it sorted, but we're here to tell you, you've forgotten the cause of the oppressed. You've forgotten the, the foreigner amongst you, the widow, right? Yeah. That's the, that is the prophetic word over and over again. And so it always, the prophetic word always assumes a center of power, which has grown smug and complacent and lost its way. And prophets are never welcome in those places. Yeah. So if you stand up and give a prophecy in your charismatic church about, you know, the, 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 the favorite presidential candidate or whatever, or the favorite movement towards Europe or whatever that everybody, you know, everybody in the room already basically agrees with. So if you give your prophecy and everybody cheers for you, you, you know, you're a false prophet. It, it has nothing to do with whether you get your predictions right or not. It's right. with whether you're giving what itching ears want to hear. Itching ears. I remember you saying that in the mark. Um, yeah. when you looked at that in mark. So here it's kind of like, listen, when you, when you offer righteous, the way of righteous of God's way to people, when you're living this out and they don't like it, that's good. That means you're a prophet because this is what prophets do. They yeah. speak God's truth into places that have grown complacent and lost their way. Yeah. Yeah. And he's and, kind of saying, when you act in my name, when you act like I would act, uh, you will, this will, this is what will happen. And it feels to me that in some ways, while he's made these distinctions between these different groups of people, poor in spirit, the mourners, the meek, and so on. Actually, these, this catch-all at the end is about persecution in general. And, and that actually, I wonder whether in some ways it applies to all the groups that have gone before. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? It is kind of a catch-all. It was like, because the reason why they're meek or they're humble or they're poor is probably because somewhere along the way, the wider society yeah. voiced that on them. Yeah. 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 So we're going to come to close, but we want to... famous passages about um, many a song has been written certainly a children's song you i'm a city on a hill yeah right um and uh and it's hard to know what, what new there is to say about it i don't mean that in an arrogant sense because of course all of us will be familiar you know the light in the darkness it's you know that's very clear i've often liked the um the idea that actually you can have the smallest amount of light and darkness cannot quench it it's you know light is always more powerful than darkness um and then you then you have the salt of the earth, the kind of the preservation idea that salt preserves. Meat, yeah. But it also um, is good for the soil. Um, it, it, um, there's a lot of things that those kind of things uh, allude to. Is there anything that you feel like has been helpful in your research? Or well, this is a lot of this. One of the things about the Sermon on the Mount is that it's um, it's about being of use of good use and like being fruitful in the world. And so the salt, like the, the idea that don't be like salt that's lost its usefulness, you'll just be cast out. And mm -hmm. eventually, you know, in a couple of weeks time, we're gonna to get to the, the language of Gehenna. Yeah. And uh, that's, the, that is the language, which in English we call hell, but Jesus didn't use the word hell. He was talking about a place of, of utter waste, of burning rubbish. And, uh, and, and it's connected to here, like, don't be like salt that's loose at saltiness. Don't be like a branch that doesn't bear fruit. Don't be like yeah. eyes that cause people to lust. Don't be like, uh, it's always the idea like, don't be a, a person in this world that leads to utter worthlessness or yeah. uselessness. And there's also a kind of a sense of like, get your own house in order. So the Sermon on the Mount is not a manifesto for how the whole world should run. It's a manifesto for how people who call themselves followers of Jesus should yeah. act. Yeah. Is very different. Yeah. And the Sermon on the Mount is not a solution to poverty or to violence. It's not, it's not some kind of legal solution to the problems of poverty. It's not a solution to world violence. All it is is saying, if you call yourself my way, my followers, this is my way. Yeah. yeah. And, and if you do it, if you, if you act this way about violence or about money, you might end up being killed, by the way. It's not a solution to violence, but this is still my way anyway. Do it anyway, right? Yeah. And there's a sense of like, get your own house in order. This is how we do things. The rest of the world can look at us. You're not trying to, the city on the hill is not, it's not make the whole world one big city on a hill. It's you're a city on a hill. People are watching you. 
you are light, people are watching you, right? It's that kind of idea of like, um, it's sort of passive in a way. It's not, it's not about like forcing the whole world to follow the Sermon on the Mount. It's just like, be, be something that people can look at. And when they look at you, make sure that it, it looks good. And of course, to Matthew's Jewish audience, there'll be echoes there of um, the mandate given to Israel, which is to yeah, be distinct. The the world. Yeah. yeah. You know, Israel was there to be good news to the world. And Jesus is kind of reclaiming that and saying, this is still true. It may be true in a different way, but it's still true of you. Yeah. Um, and there may be other people, not just the people of Israel, invited in to be part of that. But this is true. This right. is true. This is a mandate. And salt and light are distinctive in their context. And also light to the whole world is, is interesting. And you're right. There is an expansion very early on to more than just Israelite. Yeah. And it yeah. is part of this. Again, it's part of this Jesus saying, look, I'm not abolishing the law. I'm fulfilling it. Go look in your own law. The Jews are the light to the whole world. Like, and this was an early Christian idea. They were trying to, these Jewish believers in Jesus were trying to figure out how do we keep our Jewish hair, like our Jewish scriptures um what do we make of all that and 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 in light of jesus and they're like they go into their jewish scriptures and they go oh well yeah look this is a light to the whole world so that kind of language becomes quite uh important yeah. for early christians yeah yeah so i mean that that's what i would say like there's this idea of usefulness uh the sermon on the mount is a very it is a very active text it, yeah you no know, evangelicals get all worried thinking about like works righteousness and salvation by works and you just gotta park that for a while there's a lot of doing in here jesus says do your good works yeah that people will see god's and and bless and praise him right like yeah. there is a lot of works here it's not about salvation by works but there is yeah. And, yeah. and a lot of it is be useful be good be fruitful to people don't be a cause of more evil in the world but stop the evil in its tracks like it it, it stops with you kind of thing well, I mean, it, even that happens in the bit that I'm preaching on Sunday, where um, he talks about, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, this yeah. is kind of do good, even better than those religious people over there. You know? It's very active. Yeah, it's very, it's, active. Very, it's very social. It's very outward. It's very political. It's very public. It's not a private moment in your inner heart. Yeah, it really isn't. And you'll get loads of people. Christendom will like to make the Sermon on the Mount a very private thing. Yeah. Because you can't run a country according to the Sermon on the Mount. So they don't like it. Yeah. All these Christians that really want to run countries, they don't like the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> they they actively don't like it. You see them. They don't they don't use it. They don't read it. Yeah. Whenever they mention it, it's to explain them why they're an exception to it. Yeah. Um, but that's but that's not what's happening here. Jesus is saying, This is our rule of life, this is how we're going to act, and yeah. we're going to do it together. It's a public yeah. uh, communal thing they're doing together. So in summary, what we've looked at is be blessed to be a blessing. Uh, and that's what those two bits of scripture uh, look at. And so we're going to wrap things up there. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask Stephen whether you can pray. Stephen, would you pray for us um, All right. as we close? Well, I think I just want to pray that very simple prayer, you know. Um, come, Lord Jesus, and may your will be done on earth as in heaven. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us uh, today. Thank you for tuning in on uh, the various ways that we uh, broadcast this or if you're listening later on the podcast. We'll be live again eight o'clock next week uh, where Stephen and I will be looking at uh, verses 17 and onwards as we continue in the Sermon on the Mount. Stephen, thank you for joining us this week. It's great been great time. to reconnect live again. And, uh, and do let other people know as well if you'd like to invite them along next week. It'd be great to have you uh, with us. Have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you soon. Take care. Joining us, everyone. Bye. Bye.